Hello everyone, it's Ted Bauman here, editor of Big Picture, Big Profits, and of the Bauman Letter. Before I proceed, remember that you can subscribe to either or both of these by clicking on the little I above my left uh, shoulder. Uh, that is uh, essentially a, um, an offer. You can either um, sign up for our free newsletter, which is uh, Big Picture, Big uh, Profits, uh, which gives you access to these videos uh, and also written uh, articles by myself and Clint Lee and sometimes other people or the Bauman letter which gives you a 12 back or sorry 12 month money back guarantee uh, that's where I make stock recommendations and also essentially keep tabs of the market and um, you know keep my readers uh, updated on what's going on with their investments now uh, today I want to talk about two things which I believe the f mainstream financial press uh, are uh, reporting poorly I believe that they are uh, leaping to conclusions and really generating clickbait headlines uh, that don't necessarily reflect what's going on underneath the uh, the hood, if you like, of the economy and of the financial system. I think that there are interests behind this. Uh, part of it is that um, I think the mainstream financial press finds it easier just to use lazy platitudes and um, you know, just follow the herd, as it were. But on the other hand, I think that there are some financial interests that prefer that people think of things in one way as opposed to another, because it's good for their bottom lines. Let's start with the yield curve. What's a yield curve? A yield curve is essentially this. Here is a chart that shows yield curves, uh, basically two of them. One is from the first day, the first trading day of this year, that is the 3rd of January. And the second one is from the 30th, of March, the day that I recorded this video. Now, what it's showing you is the rates uh, on different maturities. So starting with one month uh, through two, three, and then right across up until 30 year bonds, what you can see is the uh, amount of yield that you get at current rates. And those rates, of course, are set by market trading. Uh, those are not the coupons uh, at which the bonds were initially issued. They are the yields that uh, are being set by people buying and selling the bonds. And of course, the lower the price of a bond, the higher its yield goes, <clears throat> which means that people are trying to get rid of them rather than buy them. And what this yield curve tells us is that short-term interest rate, well, first of all, it tells us that all interest rates across the yield curve have risen since the beginning of the year. But those at the short end uh, of the, the curve, particularly um, the uh, mid-range, in other words, from one, two, three, uh, f f and five year, those have risen much more than longer term yields, particularly the 10 year, 20 and 30. Now, why is that important? Well, uh, in economic and financial law, an inverted yield curve, uh, which is basically one where short term interest rates are higher than long term interest rates, is a sign that the uh, central bank might be making a mistake. In other words, the idea is that by raising interest rates that the Federal Reserve might be inducing a recession. If you're going to get a recession coming up in the future, that means that um, sure, in the short term, you want to uh, you don't want to be stuck with bonds that yield less than um, the, the inflation rate or what the you know what the Federal Reserve's target price is. So you sell short-term bonds, but then you buy long-term bonds because you think that the economy is going to slow down in the future, and you'll make better returns by holding long-term bonds like tens, twenties, or thirties. So essentially, when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. It's an assumption that the Federal Reserve is making a mistake and will induce a recession, uh, which will then lead to better returns for long-term bonds. Now, uh, it, maybe it's not a mistake. Back in the 1980s, Paul Volcker, the head of the Fed, engineered a recession that vanquished double-digit inflation. Um, and it did so, or he did so, by raising interest rates to the point where unemployment hit nearly 11%. Now, Nobody's accusing the Fed of having done that inadvertently or by mistake in that point. In other words, it chose to pay the high price of, of controlling inflation by engineering a recession. Now, that's not something that bankers want to do today. As much as they talk about their duty to support jobs and growth, um, they want to uh, reduce prices basically to try to bring stability back uh, to the economy. They want to do so without uh, causing a recession, which is what people call a soft landing. Now, why are they doing this? Here's a chart that shows recent inflation. It's going back uh, 
uh, to 1998, so you can see it in comparative terms. But clearly, since the uh, in the last 30 years, we've never ever had inflation like this. Uh, you can see that both um, headline inflation and core inflation, which basically strips out energy and food and other things like that, is just way above where it. Um, you know, where the target is. So this is not the entire uh, inflation rate. This is the overshoot relative to the Fed's target rate. And right now the Fed is uh, having to figure out how to rein this in. And the only tool it has uh, in its arsenal is to raise interest rates. Now here's a picture rather, uh, you know, it, it's a table that I put together that shows the current uh, rate of change or the rate of change since the beginning of the year in the yields on various maturities. As you can see, the biggest gains come in that sort of very short term, uh, you know, really from one month up to a year. That's that's where we've seen triple digits. We're also seeing triple digits in the two and three year, um, but um, it, nothing like the very short term. And that, of course, uh, reflects the fact that people have been dumping short term bonds as quickly as they can because they don't want to get stuck with them at, um, uh, you know, yields that are below uh, you know, what the Fed is going to be doing in the short term. Uh, and so that's why those yields have risen. Now, yields have risen right across uh, the whole curve. But the point is that short term yields are rising much faster than longer term yields. The set, the two, for example, is up by nearly 200 percent since the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, in, in other words, that's basically the, uh, you know, almost a doubling of the interest rate, whereas the 10 is up by only 44 percent. Now, um, when you have that kind of action, when the two is up very strongly, but the 10 less so, this is what happens. This is what's called the two and 10 year spread. Uh, and it shows uh, basically the difference between the two. When the two uh, is, uh, you know, basically higher than the 10, um, then it falls below that red line. That's what's called an inversion in the two to 10 spread. And look at the, the track record. Every time that happens, Every time the, the, the two to 10 year spread falls below uh, parity, uh, you know, basically right at that point, you get a recession. And that's why people say that this is such an effective way of predicting, uh, you know, future recessions. So look where we are right now. It's just about to plunge below it. It did actually plunge below it temporarily a couple of weeks ago. Uh, or sorry, a couple of days ago, but then it's pulled back a little bit. In other words, the two has fallen and the 10 um, uh, has risen uh, and that has uh, prevented us from falling below that. But you can see the trend. That's where we're headed. Now, remember, this reflects expectations in the bond markets. It's not something that reflects actual economic activity because actual economic activity is not that bad. We still have uh, strong em uh, employment growth. We still have, uh, as I'm going to talk in a moment, very strong profitability, and we still have a, a rapidly growing economy. So here's the funny thing. Here's a chart that shows uh, essentially the advanced decline line for the S&P 500. The advanced decline line is uh, basically the, the number of stocks that are uh, uh, rising in price versus the number of stocks that are falling in price. And after a big pullback since the beginning of the year, if you look on the right hand side, you can see that the, the number of stocks that are advancing has increased very substantially relative to those that are declining. That red line on the bottom shows that we are uh, you know, basically heading back to the kind of uh, conditions we had earlier this year when we reached a peak, I believe, on the 3rd of January. So even though we have the potential for an inverted yield curve, the market doesn't seem to worry about it. Here's the month to date performance of a couple of baskets of stocks or rather one basket versus two. Um, indexes. First in light blue is the Goldman Sachs long duration basket. Those are the growth stocks, the ones that really got hammered uh, at, at the beginning of this year and really have been struggling since the beginning of last year. The next is the S&P 500 and the last is the NASDAQ. All three are up very substantially this year. In fact, uh, this month, uh, March, uh, will probably turn out to be the best month for stocks since October last year. Now, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? I mean, basically, it's saying uh, the stock market is saying uh, that, uh, we're, you know, we're not worried about a recession. Why would that be? On the one hand, you've got the, um, the bond market saying through its traditional inversion of the yield curve that, um, you know, we think a recession is coming. On the other hand, you've got the stock market saying, nah, we don't think so. Well, here's what I think. And here's what very, very few people are, are actually acknowledging. I think that a lot of stock market investors are betting that the Fed is going to go really hard on interest rate increases in the short term, 
um, which will cause a recession, but the recession won't last forever. Instead, what's going to happen is that we will get back to the sort of very slow growth under 2% low inflation environment that did so well for stocks, particularly tech stocks, in the period after uh, the subprime crisis. For over a decade, we saw great returns. We had an environment where we had slow economic growth, which made um, real economy stocks less attractive. Uh, we had very low interest rates because we had very low inflation, and that led people to pile into tech stocks. So what I think is happening um, is that the, the, the market is pricing in a recession, but a recession that won't last very long and will be followed up with low wage growth, low economic uh, activity growth, GDP, uh, but rising profits. And that means uh, that for the what they're actually doing is getting themselves in a position now where they can take advantage of that later. Remember, a recession is only two quarters of negative GDP growth, so that could come and go pretty quickly. So instead of thinking about a recession um, as the end of the world, maybe the way to think about it is um, that it's going to be a temporary uh, measure or a temporary correction, which then returns us to something like we had before. Now, um, will that be the case? Who knows? But the critical thing is that that, I think, explains short term stock price movements. It's not just animal spirits. Um, there's a logical reason to expect that there might be um, some gains to be had over a longer term time frame in the stocks that have been hit the worst over the last year. Now, the second thing I want to talk about today uh, is the so-called wage price spiral. Now, the wage price spiral is uh, essentially uh, the idea that when you have inflation that becomes baked into people's expectations, uh, people start to anticipate price rises and to start pricing them in ahead of time, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Consider a, a company that makes widgets. Well, uh, the company that makes widgets employs people. Those people um, demand that their wages be increased by faster than the inflation rate. Um, so they then go to their employers and say, hey, you know, our, our union contract next time, we want it to be, um, you know, 3% plus one. If the inflation rate is 3%, they want a 4% raise, so they get a net increase. Uh, in order to, to cope with that, the widget company then raises its prices by at least that much, which of course causes inflation, which then feeds back into the prices that its workers pay, so on and so on. So you get a spiral where higher prices lead to higher wage demands, which lead to higher prices, which lead to higher wage demands. Now, this has been a very popular way of understanding inflation. People like Larry Summers, Mohammed El Arian, and some of the other inflation hawks, um, you know, who've been critical of the Fed, use this as their explanation because this is what happened in the 70s. But here's the thing. According to the Commerce Department's Bureau of Economic Analysis, domestic corporate profits um, and, uh, reached $2.8 trillion last year, up from $2.2 tri trillion in 2020. That's the largest annual increase since 1976. So basically, you had an enormous increase in uh, corporate profits. Now, remember, corporate profits are the difference between the cost of production and your revenues and everything else. So if profits are rising that much in a period of inflation, that tells you something. That tells you that wages are not pushing um, into corporate profits. Let's explore why. Now, um, that increase from last year to this year was 25%. In other words, uh, corporate profits rose by 25% from 2020 to 2021 during a period when inflation was supposed to be putting pressure on margins. Now, what happened to wages? Remember, the wage price spiral is supposed to be wages uh, increase faster than inflation because of employee demands, which then leads uh, companies to raise their prices, which then feeds back into wages. Well, corporate profits rose by 25%, but consumer prices only rose by 7%. Right. OK, so the companies have been using inflation as an excuse for rising prices, but their profits rose by 25 percent. But the important thing, the critical thing is that the so-called labor share of national income fell back to levels before the pandemic. Here's a chart that shows that you can see from 2020 to 21 uh, pre-tax profits rose by 25 percent. Consumer uh, price uh, or CPI only rose by 7 percent. Now, these companies have been complaining loudly about rising costs for raw materials and labor for most of 2021, but 
they didn't uh, suffer for those costs. They raised their prices and then some. Now, you find that if you look at corporate earnings calls, CEOs just can't stop bragging about jacking up prices and being able to uh, keep their profits soaring. Uh, and today's profit data shows that they're being successful. They are actually not suffering from inflation at all. They're, in fact, they're doing extremely well. And that's because they have pricing power. Now, uh, here's a, a chart that shows US pre-tax corporate profits. And just look at the trend line. I mean, since... Uh, Basically, since the subprime crisis, corporate profits have been on their way up. They fell during COVID, but look at that. Boom, just incredible. Basically doubling since, uh, you know, since the subprime crisis. Now, uh, here is the profit margins. We haven't seen profit margins this big since 1950, folks. So here you have the, the uh, you know, basically the the, the, you know, the, the, the corporate class in America claiming that inflation is a huge danger because it's going to drive up wages and squeeze profit margins and slow the economy and cause them to stop investing. But look at how much money they're making. How could that possibly be the case? Now, remember that this is not a short term thing. Here is a corporate profits before tax. This is a longer term perspective, actually a shorter term perspective. But it just shows you that corporate profits before tax were, were really kind of dawdling along, um, you know, at a, a fairly straightforward uh, level, you know, they were kind of around $2.2 trillion. Um, but now they have reached just an extraordinary level. I mean, they have they have almost gone up by 50% since uh, just before the COVID-19 uh, crisis or COVID-19 crisis. Now let's look at what's happened to employee compensation. Uh, again, this goes back to 1947. But employee compensation really bounced around between about 62 and 66 percent of um, gross value added uh, in the economy. It fell after the uh, dot-com crisis quite dramatically, uh, partly because uh, you were having, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the companies that, that started to do well after the subprime crisis, or sorry, dot-com, were technology firms that have lower labor costs. Uh, then it spiked again during COVID, but look, it's falling back down again. The bottom line here, folks, is that people are telling you that inflation is being driven by wage costs, but it's really ultimately the surge in profits. And, you know, if you've got profits rising that much, eclipsing, far eclipsing rises in worker pay, obviously you're not having a wage price spiral. It's not wages that are driving prices higher. It's that companies are able to raise their prices faster than inflation, thereby contributing in, to inflation without having that feedback into wages so they can increase their profits. Mm -hmm. That's completely inconsistent with a wage price spiral. There's no other way to put it. So when people start blaming workers for rising income or sorry, rising prices, forget that. It's not them. Now, in all post-war economic recoveries before the dot-com crisis, the lion's share of the increase in national income after that crisis went to labor compensation uh, rather than corporate profits. It was only after dot-com that uh, we began to see a reversal of that. Here's a chart that shows that, again, going back to World War II, uh, you can see that whenever there's a, re a recession, um, uh, labor's share of GDP falls, but then it rises pretty substantially. Uh, and look at what happened after dot-com, it stagnated. Now, what's the big difference? What happened after dot-com? Well, one of the things was the uh, that unions had essentially been uh, crushed in the United States starting in the 1980s with the Reagan administration. So they weren't in a position, uh, labor wasn't in a position to demand higher wages. But the other thing, of course, was the migration of uh, a big chunk of national value added being created in the technology sector, which has relatively low labor costs. But uh, at this point, what we're seeing is much, much bigger than that. We're seeing across the board uh, companies being able to raise their prices without having to raise their wages commensurately. And so those increases are basically coming at the expenses of low and mid-level workers. Uh, you know, top executives are getting, you know, bonuses like you wouldn't believe. Starbucks CEO Kevin Johnson saw his compensation soar by 39% to $20.4 million from 2020 to 2021. 39% increase in this guy's uh, compensation just in one year. We talk about the, uh, the you know, wages rising by three to four or 5% in a year, and we get freaked out like that's a, a major economic problem. 
But that's not the problem. The problem is ultimately that companies are able to raise their prices. And this goes back to something I've been talking about for years, which is the lack of competitiveness in the United States economy. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't businesses that do struggle because of this. Most small businesses, restaurants, uh, you know, any kind of business that has a large labor component, yes, they're struggling. But the biggest, deep, deepest pocketed companies in the United States are not struggling because of inflation. They are actually achieving the highest profits rate they've had since 1950. Now, here's what's in, uh, you know interesting. Uh, you know, you would think that uh, this is a, an unpopular view that uh, you know maybe I'm flirting with some kind of socialist or left-wing approach. But here's a chart that shows that of all political party uh, affiliation in the United States, everybody, including Republicans, a majority of them believe that large corporations are taking advantage of the pandemic to raise prices. 51% of Republicans, 62% of independents, 76% of Democrats, and overall 63% of people believe that uh, large companies are abusing the situation to try to increase their profits by raising prices. Now, one could say, well, in a free market, you can do what you like. But the problem is that we don't have a free market. We haven't had a free market really pretty much ever because markets are always governed by rules and regulations, laws, and all sorts of things. Um, particularly when it comes to competition policy. And we haven't had effective competition policy in this country since the Reagan administration, when the, uh, basically uh, Reagan's people dismantled uh, the competition policy. It's starting to come back. Uh, the Biden administration has uh, appointed people who have strong uh, views on this and who are committed to uh, reintroducing healthy competition. And that should lead to, to lower prices. In the meantime, my message to you is when somebody blames workers for rising prices and inflation, you refer them to this video. Tell them to go watch it because it's just simply not true. Uh, mm. Corporations and the leaders of corporations are making a money hand over fist and are able to increase their profits and their own pay uh, at a far larger rate than anybody else in the economy. Now, again, you could say, well, that's the way the ball bounces. But remember, every ball game has a referee and the referee is the government. And the referees in this case are very, very close to the team on the one side, the side of the bosses. This is Ted Bauman signing off. I will talk to you again in two weeks time uh, because I'm going to be on uh, vacation next week with my daughter who has spring break. We're going to be taking a trip. Take care.